Hello, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's session, this afternoon's Middle East session. Um, it may be MIPS' uh, 50th year uh, anniversary that we're celebrating this week. Um, I seem to have been covering the Middle East for almost as many years, certainly for 30 years. Uh, and yet the Middle East remains the most exciting, the most vibrant, the most active, the most crazy and wonderful uh, market for television, um, I think, on the planet. But it has some challenges, and that's what our expert panel uh, will help guide us through this afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Forrester. I'm a journalist based in London, but I seem to shuttle back and forth to the Middle East. Uh, uh, it, well, it's very good for my air miles, if nothing else. Um, we have an expert panel. Let's start off uh, on my left, uh, on your immediate left here. Uh, Mohammed Yusuf is CEO at ER Live. Um, Mohammed is, uh, has a terrific uh, resume, uh, including a, a period at, uh, at Arabsat. But now he's looking after the Middle East's uh, latest uh, new satellite, this latest hotbird. Um, and we'll learn a little more uh, about his uh, hopes and wishes for that satellite in a moment. Um, adjacent to him is Nick Grande, MD, a Dubai-based channel sculptor, uh, a TV consultancy. Uh, Nick has worked with some very heavyweight companies in the region, not least Orbit Showtime, uh, 2454, and people like Sky News Arabia. Uh, we'll learn a little more from Nick again in a moment. Um, on his left is um, Yusuf El Deeb the highly regarded founder chairman of uh, Takayel Entertainment, who launched uh, Fatafit TV. Uh, we'll learn a little more about Fatafit, uh, which is now part of Discovery's portfolio of channels. Uh, uh, finally, and last but by absolutely not least, uh, Marwan Halal, well known to the industry for his long association, association with NBC Universal, and now a consultant in the region, um, and he knows, uh, well, a thing or two about television. Uh, gentlemen, welcome, and let's, uh, let's uh, 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 certainly give some forecasts for, for uh, 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 broadcasting in the region. Um, incidentally, ladies and gentlemen, this is gonna be an interactive session. Think of the questions you want to pose to these experts. Uh, we'll come to Q&A a little later. But first, can I kick off with Nick Grande? Nick, can you um, set the scene for us uh, with some stats? Thank you very much, Chris. And thank you to MIP and to Yarlai for inviting me to, uh, to be involved in this session. And uh, um, we're going to st start here with, a, with a, a look at the high definition world in uh, the Middle East. In, there's a paper you, we may have seen on the way in, uh, which we issued this year, um, to look at the state of play. This is obviously very important for the television industry in terms of what's going on, particularly with BDR Live. And uh, it's, it's not a new story in the region, but it's, uh, it's been growing a lot. So four years ago, we actually did a, a study on high definition at the time. Um, there was only one high definition television channel in the region and things were already moving quite fast um, in Europe um, and elsewhere. Um, we were hoping to see the World Cup being used as a driver to build on high definition, but that didn't end up happening. But if we look now, what we see is a very different picture. Suddenly from one channel, we've, we're up to 103 high definition channels, and that number is growing all the time. Um, almost, over 10% of, the, of the, the channel population in the region, in fact, is, is high def. And a big driver for that is the pay TV, pay TV network, Orbit Showtime. Um, they are, in fact, that number has already gone up, um, even higher, and they are a big player. We also see that the government-owned channels um, play a significant role in terms of the drive of, of high-definition television. About half the, uh, just under half the channels that we see are being um, launched by government entities. So, that's um, a snapshot, but what's interesting is that most of the television channels in the region are um, in high def are free to air, just like their standard definition counterparts. And what the paper uh, that you might well have uh, um, puts together is, a, is an argument for why we should be looking at encryption as a, as a means of driving high definition in the market and also improving the business model for television in the region. The business model at the moment 
is not a particularly pretty one. Um, advertising revenues at a net level are well below a billion dollars. And when you consider that uh, there are between six and 800 uh, credible TV channels in that market, that doesn't create a very compelling revenue number for a, for a broadcaster, especially when close to half of that money is being spent on satellite capacity before we even think about staff and programming costs. Um, now, to go high def is going to add another six, five, six hundred thousand dollars to the price tag of capacity. So you can see how the economics of high definition in a free-to-air environment are pretty tough. Now, if we look at Europe by comparison, um, for those of you from this market, um, high definition is routinely encrypted. I mean, between 75 and 95 percent of, of the channels on the, the main hotspots are encrypted. And looking a little more closely at that, um, very often they're encrypted high definition versions of standard definition free to air channels. So clearly, there's a reason, an economic reason, why broadcasters are choosing to encrypt their high definition feeds. And if we look at the wider picture around the world, we can see that pay TV or encryption in the region, I mean, this is terribly small, but all I wanted you to focus on is that red line at the bottom, between six and eight percent penetration. So just a, every line above that is, is above 15 percent. If you go halfway up the table, you know, most of the markets that we see are above 50 percent in terms of pay TV penetration. Um, so the Middle East has a huge opportunity in terms of, of encrypted services. Um, if we look at the market, we could say, well, wh why, why does it matter? Um, well, first of all, encryption doesn't have to be the same as subscription. So we've seen other examples where a free service is provided with a, with a platform which allows the equipment that's required to get high definition to the home to reach that home in the first place. Um, I guess many people in the room are familiar with the need for an MPEG-4 set-top box. The free-to-air services in, uh, in the Middle East are all broadcast on MPEG-2, so there's actually a very small number of, uh, of boxes out there at the moment. And having um, a means of driving them into the market through an encrypted service so that if you want high definition, you need to, uh, to get uh, this particular box and market that service accordingly and drive some value actually helps to drive the penetration of the market. Why hasn't, I mean, sorry, just a, if you look at uh, the European market, there's a good example of this, which is um, the HD plus model, um, which Germany was historically a very difficult market to crack from a pay TV or an encryption perspective. And uh, the SCS Astra um, HD plus model overcame that by having a, a set top box that was um, basically sold as a, a, with an encryption platform on board, 12 months of free content, um, but uh, allowing the consumer to get content that they couldn't receive through a regular MPEG-4 box. That model has been attempted in, in the Middle East. Um, we see the NBC channels being encrypted. Um, but so far, there hasn't been a big sort of drive. And I think there are a number of factors that, uh, that need to be in, in place before it to work. There needs to be enough bandwidth for the channels. The platform, the box has to be a good box, and it needs to be well distributed. The content offering needs to be compelling enough, but the price is the, and the marketing of that product is also a key component so, so that people are compelled when they compare with in the supermarket when they're going in to buy their equipment, they choose to buy this box as opposed to another one. This approach has a long-term benefit to the industry and to consumers. It means that uh, they get better quality content. There's a, a platform which means that there's more consistent um, experience, they get electronic programming guide for the first time, and audiences um, like the Filipino audience, the Russian audience, the Iranian audience can start to see product which is specifically catering for their needs that wouldn't otherwise come to the market. It creates a more diverse market, more efficiency, and a more attractive to investment. And the alternative, well, if we look at the current trend, um, revenues without the encryption remain flat on the pay TV side and the advertising side, but the cost goes up, which means we see more and more government investment 
and more and more uh, less and less consumer driven market led investment viewers basically have to settle for what they're given so um, I think there's a strong and compelling case for using high definition as a means of improving the, the viewers experience of television in the region thank you Um, thanks, Nick, for that, uh, for that little scene setter. Um, everyone in this room recognizes that high definition is the way the industry is going. But, Mohammed Yusuf, um, you, in, in providing a satellite which is uniquely HD only, you also have to hope that that will drive pay TV somewhere along the line. Is, is that the case? Thank you, Chris. Um, first, let me thank uh, MIB. I'm glad that we're here in the, uh, their 50th anniversary, and Basil has done a great job to support us. But before I start, I just want to set the expectation of you guys. If you think that after one hour you understand the future of TV in the Middle East, good luck. I think uh, Chris said it uh, right uh, perfectly. He said, it's exciting, it's growing, but the key word he said, it's crazy market. And it is crazy in the Middle East TV. And uh, we're owned by SCS, uh, the largest, one of the largest satellite operators. And they have 52 satellites operating all over the world. And they look at me and say, it's crazy in here. How, how you guys do business? So it is really different in the Middle East. I know um, you hear that uh, cliche a lot. It's different. Every market is different. But in the Middle East, it's crazy different. The other thing I, um, I also wanted to share with you, I just realized that we are all in the wrong business, guys. Because I was on a session before this, and I just learned that a little game about shooting people made $1 billion in 15 days. And I don't think us, or Nilesat, or Arabsat, all the satellite operators will make 15, $1 billion in 15 years. So I just, I was so excited coming in here and then all of a sudden, you know, kind of lost the excitement when I saw a little game made $1 billion in 15 days. That said, um, Yalive is all about HD. Yes, uh, to answer your question, yes, we, we, the first thing that they teach you in any negotiation uh, uh, class is enlarge the pie. And when we came into Yalive, we looked at how can we enlarge the pie to make room for Yalive Live or to make room for broadcasters to come on a third satellite because most broadcasters are on two satellites already. And we thought that there has to be a different model that allows the broadcasters to make money and not depend only on advertisement because we have 600 free to air channels in the Middle East. And guess what? How many of those are making money? out of advertisement, especially when you talk to any TV channel, they tell you now that advertisement is going down. So how can they, um, how can they make it? Uh, and especially when you have uh, um, demand for good content. Well, good content comes at a price. It's not free. And um, I was on a session the other day. People were complaining about encryption and Who's going to protect the viewers? Protect them from what? Who said that TV has to be for free? I mean, it's, there is no law against that. Granted, there has to be some model where we allow the broadcasters to make a little bit of money so they can produce and buy good content. And we did a market study in the Middle East in six countries. And we found that uh, people are willing to pay a little bit not the $100 uh, a month level, but they're willing to pay if you give them good enough content. So um, we have people, we, are, we really consume a lot of TV, 15,000 hours a day in the Middle East. So we watch TV. We're willing to pay for a little bit uh, uh, for, uh, if the content is right. So yes, we believe that there has to be a different model than just free to air and make advertisement, i.e. The, the latest or the old model, which basically is summarized as I, the viewer, willing to give you, the broadcasters, my free time in return for free entertainment mixed with some advertisement, 
that's the model that is being going on. I don't think this will continue for long. V uh, prime content need to be paid for, and the only way that we believe is a viewer-supported uh, model. Um, I'll come back and we'll, uh, we'll um, elaborate on those, uh, that response. Uh, may I go across to Yusuf? Yusuf El Deeb, um, uh, I don't want to be presumptuous, but I think you made a little bit of money out of Fata Feet. T tell, us, tell us more about the channel. When, when did that happen? <laughs> I, I just thank you for coming, and I hope you have more comfortable chairs than the ones we're sitting in, because... Um, uh, I, 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 I presume some of you know about this brand that we've built in the Middle East called Fetafit. And uh, if you don't, I'll just give you a small history about how it came to be. Um, in the last week of, of 2006, um, we launched the channel. We launched it on a platform of simplicity. And it's been very difficult, but successfully we've kept it simple for the last uh, six years. Uh, simple because when we launched at the time, uh, and I thought the Middle East would change, but at the time there was on the news every day explosions in, in Iraq. You know, 70 people killed, 60 people killed. Like it was like breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. And being a father, I felt that I needed a place, or, or children, or families needed a place where there was no violence and there was no religion. Yes, no religion and no politics and no, no um, cheesy melodrama. And from that, from, not, from knowing what not to do, uh, what not to put on television, we knew exactly what to do, and that is to make a simple platform of a brand that says life is good. So, so it's a very simple platform. Uh, you see our mascot is an ant, the tiniest thing in the world, so we don't presume to be big and world, um, you know, all over the world. Um, uh, the name is Fetafit, which means crumbs, sugar crumbs or bread crumbs, which is the tiniest thing you can think of. Uh, the content is about food. Uh, some people call it cooking. We like to say it's food because it's not really about the recipe. I think we were the first to not show recipes. We don't say any recipes. If you watch the channel, we, don't, we were the first to free people who had passion to cook, to free, to free them from the recipe, from the chemistry. It's not about chemistry. And, and we encourage people to innovate in the kitchen. And, and we've had tremendous response from, from the audience who love us and we love them back. And, um, and, and uh, life is good is, is, our, is the slogan that we have. And we've grown um, organically. We have close to a million fans on, on a Facebook page that, trust me, I, don't, I couldn't afford someone to manage that page until last month. Um, it, we're blessed. Uh, it's really, we're blessed to have this brand and it, and it worked. Uh, two years ago, we had a small setback that uh, you know, our principal investor died suddenly, Mr. Kharafi, he died um, on a trip to Cairo. And there was a revolution in Cairo, we lost a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of sales on our publications, because it's not just a TV channel, we have print publications, we're one of the top sellers on the iPad, and we do everything in-house. And so our investor died, and, and we've sort of been in a holding pattern for two years, looking for a buyer. And lucky for us, it wasn't, um, you know, I need to be politically correct, but it wasn't petrodollars. It wasn't someone who wanted a vanity channel. And, um, and thank God it was Discovery Networks who uh, had the foresight to, to see the brand and see the success of the brand. And, and we closed the deal in, in November, a few months ago. And um, I think Nick, I was just asking Nick outside, I think it's the first local brand that's been acquired by an international broadcaster. And, um, me and my team, because we're a very tight team, very tight creative shop, we're very, very proud of that achievement that we made it through these difficult two years. Um, but the Arab world hasn't changed. We still have explosions, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, and we still don't want to pay for content, as like Mohammed was saying a minute ago. But, um, but we survived, and we're doing well. And uh, for HD, I'll just say a couple of things about HD, because I kind of didn't want to come to this presentation because I, I'm not an HD expert in terms of broadcast. But, um, but we do have a very unique experience with HD. You know, um, uh, there's a TV series in, in the US called House. Three years ago, they announced that they were 
showing one of their first episodes shot on the small Canon 5D cameras. If you don't know what that is, it, it, you should, because it's a camera we were using three months before that, before they did. And we've been, and it allows anyone really, any, any kid, uh, and this is the magic of technology, that anyone can shoot in HD. We've been shooting in HD for three years, knowing that one day we will be in HD when, when we grow up, and we're big and we can afford it. So we have hundreds of hours of content in HD already, although we don't broadcast in HD. We shoot in HD. Shooting in HD allows you to use film lenses, allows you to have a filmic approach to lighting and to composition and to depth of field and all these things that make the picture look good. And because we do food, like pornography, it needs to look really good. So, so this helped us, a small channel, to shoot in HD in a filmic style and, um, and I think you see that, and uh, we've been getting better. We just keep trying to do better and better, and now we're, we're, we're very good. I'm, I'm very happy and proud of my team and what they've done. And, um, okay, that's, that's, uh, that's set the scene for us very well. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm just curious about the red socks and the green socks. Well, I, I mean, oh, right. we're a set of traffic lights over here. <laughs> I, know, I thought it was like sailing port and starboard. Yeah, yeah. Somebody, somebody needs a set of amber socks to sit between us. Um, uh, question, Yusuf. Um, Discovery is a fabulous organization. We admire them for, uh, for what they do. But they are, by and large, and almost exclusively, pay TV. Um, might this now encourage a transition on your channel? We're, what generally is the intention? We will never be, um, we will never not have Fatafit as a free-to-air channel. Does that make sense? Never not have? Is that two negatives? You will always, we'll be, always be free, free to air. air. Okay. However, with, with the discovery, the wonderful discovery experience around the world, and by the way, they have, they have many more free to air channels in the last, uh, bought in the last sure. year, <laughs> year and a half sure. that you know about. So no, with, with their know-how and their, and their experience, we are looking at, because we have the content already in HD, we are looking at an HD channel sometime soon. We're looking at the various you know, options scenarios available. and options okay. to do it. Yeah. Uh, but that won't be pay TV. Well, I'm asking rhetorically. Will well, let, it be pay let, TV? Let me read the future first. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Okay, we'll see. We'll come back to you. But I just want to endorse what Mohammed was saying, that you have to pay. Yeah. Someone has to pay. Someone has to pay. And, and HD, it's kind of a s silly discussion whether we should go HD or not. It's like a group of producers and a movie owner, theater owners, <coughs> looking at silent movies and say, have you heard about the talkies? You know, or, or black and white television going to color. I mean, my iPhone shoots HD. So <laughs> HD must happen, and we're just not doing it fast enough in the Middle East. Um, Marwan, um, you have a long history in the Middle East with... That sounds too old. <laughs> the, well, <laughs> reasonably long <laughs> history Still in the Middle there, East. Right. Uh, with uh, important players like NBC Universal. Um, how do you see the market locally, and uh, and what's your take on what we're discussing? Well, I mean, it goes back uh, first. Hi to everybody. Uh, it all goes back to one thing and one thing only: content. If you don't have the content, you don't have nothing. So you have nothing. Sorry. So whether you go on HD, SD, pay, cable free, that's irrelevant if you don't have the right content to show on your platform. Uh, and from my experience, I know that broadcasters are in the Middle East are willing to pay for content. Viewers are willing to pay to, for content. The, ma the, the, the thing is to find that magic formula where the content gives you back the return on your investment in buying th that content. So um, what the studios started to, uh, when the HD came in, the major studios started to charge more for HD. And the idea was HD should be treated as additional right or a separate right for licensing. So if a broadcaster comes in and buys a set of movies and series in SD and he wants HD, well, you have to pay more. And that was a substantial percentage. And they realized the sad fact that nobody is willing to pay that extra percentage because there was not enough money coming in to justify that move. First, um, the investment in HD was high enough for the broadcasters in terms of the hardware that they have to install. Second, uh, viewers had to pay for the set-top boxes to get those HD channels, so that means there's a chain of additional costs coming in. And then to have the broadcasters pay more for HD content, that was just too much to bear. 
So they went back and revised that formula to see, okay, what works on HD and what doesn't work. At some point, everything should go in HD, as Yusuf said, and I do agree with that, and most of the broadcasters, I think, they come to that realization. But interesting enough, if you go back to Nick's slides on uh, the slide that show, Nick showed us on number of channels, 104 channels of HD, you have 24 on OSN. That's like 25% pay TV channels, almost 25% of channels are on pay, knowing that the pay penetration is 6%. So that's a huge number. Yes. That's a huge number of HD channels that are available on a platform that has such a low penetration. Why is that? And that's the question, because it's being paid for. That's, that's why the channels are there, and that's why they can afford to be there. Why, why the free TV guys are still reluctant, because they're not going to get any more money. So the advertisers, the media reps, the agencies, the media buying, they're not going to pay more if you tell them that my channel is HD. Because for them, <coughs> they're buying eyeballs for that time segment and the ratings that they're getting on that specific, specific program. So practically, the, the, the chain hasn't really reached a, a 360 degree until I think we very recently where we started hearing ad, uh, ad people and advertising agency asking about the HD and um, not like to know more how that affect the, um, I mean, the perception and the viewer's uh, experience while watching an HD program and HD advertising. And I think there's a research that shows that people watching HD channels tend to watch more advertising and not zip zap between channels because they like what you see, they like the image that they're seeing. I think that's the key thing that we need to show and we need to demonstrate to a broadcaster so they can really invest and move on. And I, I think it's just happening. I mean, uh, well, I've just heard that a couple of two channels are really getting into HD hardware and more and more people are coming in into that uh, arena. And I think that, that's a good sign for the future. But, um, but is it a precursor to moving into either pay TV or the, the pay TV light model that uh, um, uh, that Mohammed is suggesting, because because we already have, if you like, I don't know about a pay TV light, but NBC has encrypted, soft encrypted its uh, its high def channels. So what might its next step be? The next step, I think, it all goes back to revenue. The advertising revenue on Pan Arab satellite is around less than a billion dollar, the 800, 900 million dollars, and until they can compensate some losses that they're going to incur by switching off the SD or moving from a free TV SD world to a pay HD model, that, ba that won't change. They need to have a balance there. But, if, but, but for NBC to switch off its standard definition feed is economic suicide. It's not going to do Absolutely. that. Absolutely. It's not going to happen in the next few it's near <laughs> It's not going to happen in the next 10 years, 15 years, un un unless there's something drastically shifting in the market, which I don't see. Yeah. And the thing is that if you look at the the problem is that we're now gearing to shift to HD while people are, sh or viewers are shifting to smartphones. So there's also the uh, dis Pressure. disconnect with reality, sure. where you have 63% of your uh, 15 plus uh, uh, viewer uh, in, U in UAE and KSA, which are the biggest two markets in the region, are using smartphone, connecting to smartphones, streaming on smartphones, and the channels are bragging that they are moving into HD while well, you have a certain disconnect there. And they need to move very quickly and not wait until the, sh the, the viewership pattern shifts totally towards uh, the mobile handset. Uh, Mohammed, you've had, you've had four of us now explain only too well the, the problems that you, you're only too aware of. How can you square that circle? How do you think you can square that circle for the likes of NBC? Because once NBC, in, in my view, makes a move, makes a deliberate move, um, into pay television, I think the other leading channels will follow. Uh, that's my view. But, but how do you see the circle being squared? Um, actually, what Parwan said uh, worked to our advantage. Um, and the reason for it is uh, when we go talk to, with the channel, we tell them, don't play or don't rig your current SD operation on other satellites and come do the new thing with us. Um, and we learned from the past. Um, in 1999 or, or 1990, middle 1990s, when um, Nightsat came online, every channel was analog and every dish was pointed at Arabsat at 26 degrees. But Nightsat came and saw the future and said, 
we're going to go only digital. So they went digital at seven degree west, which was a completely new orbital slot. And now they have the majority of the TV channels. We hope that that applies to us because we came and said the future is HD, so we're going to go HD from day one. And hopefully in the future, then Yeah Life becomes the hotspot for HD. So um, that worked to our advantage in, in, in some way because now the channels that we have, they go SD, continue their operation on SD, and then play with it on, on uh, Yeah Life without having to uh, risk their SD operation. Um, as far as NBC is concerned, I, 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 think, uh, I think NBC, obviously, they are a market leader. They went into the uh, encrypting of their um, HD. And I think once they feel comfortable that they have enough viewers on HD, then uh, uh, they eventually will have to switch down, switch off the SD. And, um, the question is when. When. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is. You're right. It's a when question, not an if question. Um, right. Uh, Nick, there's a, there's a subject none of us have mentioned up until now, uh, and that's piracy. Uh, the Where? In the Middle East? There's no piracy. <laughs> If only that were true. If only it were half true. Um, uh, piracy has been a problem. It is still a problem in, in, in some parts of the Middle East. Are we beginning to cure piracy? Um, well, yes. Um, the simple answer is that uh, the, the pairing, I mean, if we look at the pay TV platforms that do exist in the region, um, they have all, with the exception of Al Jazeera, switched to a paired box and card strategy, and that has basically eliminated code word sharing for everyone except Al Jazeera. And Al Jazeera, I think, have a slightly different strategy. They, they are much more keen on um, getting as many viewers as possible than anything else. So from their point of view, they're a little bit more relaxed about, uh, about piracy, perhaps, than, than the, uh, the platforms like Orbit Showtime, who are generating $50, $60 a month. But, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but does that include their sports channels? Are they also relaxed about... Well, piracy on the sports channel. Uh, I don't know how to answer that question without upsetting somebody, but, um, <laughs> but uh, shall we say that uh, they remain on a hacked encryption system. Yeah. Um, they are communicating to their customers that they will be moving to a paired box and card within the next 12 months. The date has moved once already, but we'll see. I mean, I think the other, the other thing, though, is that to talk about piracy more generally, I mean, um, it was very interesting to me back in November when um, Salim Abani from um, Do stood up at uh, the um, uh, Connect TV event and, uh, and said that over 90% of the data traffic on Do's network was torrents. Yeah, and uh, I think it's fair to say that most people in the well-fibred uh, parts of the Middle East are routinely uh, uh, downloading content. So there's there is a, a threat in, in terms of piracy, and it's difficult to manage uh, because of the, uh, the, the, the difficulty in policing. I mean, the, the rights owners don't have the same degree of control and communication with, with governments they, they do in Europe and the States. But, the, but local authorities uh, throughout the region um, will, will, will not in any way, shape, or form permit a computer user to enter an adult site they monitor that 100%. Why can't they do the same with BitTorrent? If we just just going back to this point about the uh, the whole question of pay TV, I, th I think um, you know the UA sorry the, the Middle East market. I've mentioned a, a hundred, over 100 channels. That's over 10% penetration. Europe HD only accounts for 9.3% of the, the, the channels. So arguably uh, the Middle East is ahead of the curve. But then if we just think about that slide. The, a significant proportion, about half of those channels are being funded by money which is not revenue. And so if we can find a model that works and get that percentage of actual encrypted channel users up from 6% to say 50 or 60%, as was in the case in half of the other ch uh, countries up there, then suddenly you've got an audience, instead of an audience of, uh, of half a million, you've got an audience of maybe you know 10, 15 million households, and suddenly we, we aren't talking about $50, we're talking about 50 cents a month, and, uh, and suddenly piracy is no longer even a question because you're talking about premium content at, uh, at a price which is affordable. And then, just for the benefit of the people in this room, I mean, 
how many people here are, 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 have channels that they like to get into the, the region, but they can't find an economic case to do it. Exactly. At, at the moment, a platform like OSN is effectively a, you know, a, a monopoly when it comes to a general entertainment, premium entertainment, so they can pick and choose the, the broadcasts they want to work with. Um, there are new entrants coming in, and I think the moves that Yar Live are making could have a significant effect on this. But there is this need to, uh, to increase, to create, as you say, a new pie, to enlarge the pie in such a way that somebody like Yusuf can say, well, you know what? We're going to have another version of Fat Afeet, which is going to show some additional content, maybe HD content. And we're not going to charge a fortune for it, but uh, it'll be available at a small pr premium to, to viewers. And people will, will eat it up. Uh, absolutely. Sorry. Well, we can, we can only hope so. Um, I want to uh, invite questions from, uh, from the audience uh, to these uh, experts. Um, anyone with uh, some burning questions? And I can barely see through the light. That's better. Thank you, guys. Um, uh, please raise your hand if you have one. Uh, oh, what, over there. Beg your pardon. I, 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 I saw Hi. Um, if you I'm could introduce a... yourself, sir. Yes, I'm Tim Stehmann. I'm um, CEO of ConCon 3D, more specialized on 3D. Uh, so I'm very um, future. Um, I, I think about the future, and I'm very hopeful for that. And I'm listening to that HD problem, and you tell us that having a channel SD and HD is a, a additional costs. Let's say like this. What about some kind of a model that we have set-top boxes, which is everything is transmitted in HD, and if you have the key, then it's um, showing HD content. Otherwise, it's downgraded to SD content. Of course, you need a better, a better processor inside that set-top box, but you don't have to pay for two satellites anymore. Yeah, OK, Nick. Um, let's put some color to this. You know, the average price of the set-top box worldwide is coming down. But one of our partners is, is a set-top box company. And you might find it hard to believe, but uh, their process, their, the memory capacity of their box used to be 2 megs. It's now 512K. Um, there's so little in the way of demand for differentiation, because at the moment, the market just doesn't understand that there's a value proposition. I mean, they get it. I want a great big TV in my house, but at the moment people don't understand why they'd pay an extra $10 for a box. And there isn't the content, so there's a chicken and egg situation. I think the kind of things that you're talking about make sense, but it all points to the fact that there needs to be a more cooperative approach between the broadcasters, the capacity owners, the content owners, the channel owners, to, in order to achieve that kind of thing. Uh, Mohammed, it's also partly a question for you, not the set-top box, but but um, uh, where the industry might go, I mean, in the immediate near future, over the next uh, 12 to 18 months, um, um, is the public sufficiently aware uh, that your HD service exists and what it might represent, a high bit rate, fabulous looking uh, uh, HD service? Um, I, I think it's, uh, it's still... Uh um, a little bit, people are still a little bit behind in terms of understanding what is it that they really need to do in order to be able to watch HD. We at Alive have a program where we go and seed the market with uh, certain dishes and we go into the people's house. But a lot of people have HD TV and they have, they, they think that by buying the HD TV they are actually watching HD already. They don't know that they need a, a receiver and uh, and then also they don't know that they need HDMI cable. We've seen so many homes in the Middle East, people have an HD receiver, an HD TV, and they only know that they connect red, green, and yellow. So they connect the, the, uh, the HD receiver with the HD TV through the RCA connection. So they're again losing on that. But, but the point he's talking about, it, it can be only done in a closed, network or a closed system. There are hundreds of uh, set-up box uh, manufacturers and, and retailers in the Middle East, and each one of them has his own firmware and he has his own way of doing things. So there is no way to really control that unless you create a closed network. So um, it, to go back to this issue, it's very difficult to implement in the Middle East because of the fact that just people buy 
uh, any box. And, uh, and like Nick said, people pay thousands in the HDTV, but when it comes to receiver, they, they look for a, a $5, $10 difference. And for set-up box manufacturer in the Middle East, their, their uh, uh, profit is, is in the range of $5. So they, they look at it. We looked at them. We talked to a number of them. They really look at it at everything because they say a $10 at the retail shelf makes a whole lot of difference. Uh, uh, Marvin, do you think the market needs more education? Do you think uh, uh, the, the, the market is still, I don't want to use the word unsophisticated, but it's... Well, if you look at the pay TV model, 15 years so far is still doesn't get through... Modest. It, yeah. So pay TV players were two or three in the region, <coughs> sorry. And then now they're consolidating into more one and still general viewer, viewers or the average uh, Arab viewers still has a tendency to confuse what is pay TV and what is free TV and why I'm paying for OSN if I can watch NBC, Dubai TV, uh, Fox for free. So even fa 15 years down the line and this, this confusion. So when you talk about HD and you talk about HD boxes and cables and satellite capacity, I don't think we're there. Well, there's a lot, a lot of room to cover before we get to that level of sophistication. Well, we can't put that all on uh, Mohammed's uh, shoulders. I mean, that's an industry problem. Must the industry do more in educating the viewer as to what's potentially out there? Well, uh, what, what, but, does, what does the industry do together? Nothing. We have no regulatory bodies. We have no, no way we, that we speak to each other and, and, and see where our future will be and work on it. We, we don't have any of that. Yeah. And maybe that goes back to something that people that tend to look at as a bless and a curse at the same time, which is the pan-regional effect. When you have all the broadcasters and all the platform are working on a pan-regional, you cannot have one regulatory body that really forces Saudi channels, UAE channels, Egyptian channels to work on the same uh, approach. So you have this coverage of 20 or 22 countries under the Arab League, but the active markets maybe come to seven. Still, every country has its own regulations and laws and uh, set up and uh, requirements. So it's really, really hard to get the industry as one body to act and, and start educating the trade or educating the ad agency or reaching out to advertisers and clients and then reaching to the viewers. You, they need to start to reaching by the money makers and the, 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 the funders that they can really fund that industry. We, but they haven't done that because it's, it's a pan-regional thing. It's very, very tough to crack. Sure. Uh, Mohammed? Let's see if we have another call. Lots of show of hands. Okay, let's start with this gentleman here. Uh, hang on a second, we'll give you the microphone, there we are. Kamal Nasir from It's Salah Television, head of New Media. I want to, uh, talking about the future of TV, how do you see the future of TV in the Middle East, especially in the uh, Gulf area, when we have pirated channels like HD and Panorama and the other channels that operate through satellite in our region? P p you mean p uh, pirated channels? Yeah, like HD, what? Panorama, pirated I'm sure. So okay, they, pirated They operate content. full day channels on near video on demand movies series yeah the, so they 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 latest yeah they they buy a pirated dvd in the yes. souk and they put it straight on, on yeah. from region yeah. 1 even before vod yeah. before the new media yeah well it's uh, i mean that's again, and what what should be done especially well, mr yusuf uh, well we don't yeah. allow such channels on our I know, satellite I know this um, and it's unfortunate and i know that nbc had um, a lot of problems uh, on that front and the uh, there was an issue, this, this very same issue discussed in the ISOG, um, where they the, um, the, uh, discussed that very extensively. But um, it has to be a collaboration between, um, the, I, I, I believe that the satellite operator has a lot to do with this, because in any contract, uh, there is a clause there that covers the satellite operator once the, it's proven that he, whoever is broadcasting, does not own the content, then the satellite operator has the right to turn it off. And we, um, we're partially owned by Abu Dhabi government, so we really um, um, have certain standards to meet. And we make sure, we get a lot of requirement for such channels, uh, because you look at us, we're a new kid in the block, we, our prices are more flexible than the others, and they come to us, and we've been turned them down because we're looking after quality. 
uh, in terms of everything we do, quality of content, quality of transmission, and al also quality of dealing with, and with our customers. And legitimacy, and legitimacy yeah. of course. There is only one satellite, actually. We don't want to name it, but it's out of Egypt. You can. You're one it's friends, it's yeah. Nile site, actually, unfortunately. It's out of Egypt. So what should be done from your experience being well, operating? I, I mean, I, I, I can tell you, and I'm sure the others will agree, uh, uh, the people who are running Nilesat would only want to run an honest shop uh, if they're made aware of it. You know? Because even the studios, major studios, are really annoyed at that. Yeah. The whole full print of the Middle East, no one is, can, is doing anything. The thing is, Chris, here, sorry, come on. It's also the halo effect of the Arab Spring. After the Arab Spring, we had only government TVs in some countries, in most of the countries, and suddenly there was room to launch new channels. And I think in the last year, we've seen 100, 110 channels coming just out of nowhere. Yep. Uh, some of them are not really well educated in norms of how they license content and where do they get those licenses. They just want to be on air and talk to their people because everybody's so hungry for new channels and besides the official government story uh, approach of every single thing that happened, so this chaotic approach created that vacuum, if you want, of unauthorized, unlicensed broadcast. Uh, that needs to be dealt, of course, as Kamal said, it's really affecting the whole region, the whole industry, but it's being a little bit slow in tackling that, mainly because governments have higher priorities on their list uh, not to go after a movie here or a series there that was broadcasted illegally. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're right. I, I think, I, uh, just to make sure, it really has to come from a good citizen uh, in terms of satellite uh, um, operation, really. Um, I, I share something with you. We have a, few, a small capacity that we configured for uh, communication. So we have a customer who's using that for IP backhauling. And um, we got a call from OSN saying that on your satellite, people are sending the key to, uh, to hack our um, um, PC's uh, system. So and uh, when, once we check that, we immediately shut down the customer. And uh, so it has to come from the satellite operator because he controls uh, what goes on his satellite. It's tough. Thank there you. Were other, there were Thank other you. questions. Yes, in the very front. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Kerim Safiyedin, founder of Cinemos.com. It's a VOD service for the Arab world. <laughs> uh, I'm the little guy in the room here. And uh, I would love to pick uh, all of your brains together. But um, what, the first thing that comes to my mind with the future of TV in the Middle East is how do you actually think about the future? Uh, the first thing that would come to my mind would be look at innovation. Um, you know, in, in the States, everybody looks at Silicon Valley, and this is where the future is. So just a small comment before my question. Um, we're a small startup that's a year and a half old. Um, we've managed to cover a lot of issues that have been discussed. So, in its essence, Vid On Demand Online has an HD or non-HD component to it. Um, we noticed that it doesn't matter to the user. What matters is content, content, content. So that was uh, covered by Fatafit, for instance. They did a great job on content. And for uh, Mr. Youssef, I think that the race is already won. Everybody will switch to HD, but um, isn't there, that's my question, isn't there a natural selection that needs to occur in the sense that we have, what, 500 free to air, 600 free to air channels in the, in the region? Um, shouldn't the big boys survive and would be the ones to, because what I think the solution to your problem is actually an investment. Um, big broadcasters just need to treat this as an investment and not an if. So it has to occur. Um, the only ones who could do that are well known, the NBCs of the world and such. Um, so I guess, wouldn't you agree that uh, there is natural selection that needs to be done, that a lot of the small players, the political channels, the funded by daddy channels need to, um, need to kind of die by themselves, and how do we get there? Good question. <laughs> a very good question. Um, it goes back to what Chris said. It's a crazy market, and um, many of the channels operating in the Middle East not commercially operating. So how can you beat that? It, it, it's just not commercially operated. They can lose money and continue to lose money, and that's, they're happy with that because they have a certain message that they're sending, and they look at it that as a marketing cost. So it's, it's sometimes very difficult to, to put sense into uh, these people. That said, eventually everybody's gonna have to go uh, um, HD, and they're gonna have, when they see 
the market leaders going in one direction, normally they follow. But you need to show them, um, like, like for example, when we discuss these kind of things, we tell the people, um, like for embassy, in the early days, they say, you know, I've been watched by 40 million people. My answer was, wouldn't you love to see 40 million people paying you one cent each? On top of the advertisement that you're making? Of course the answer was yes, and that's why they went into that direction. It, the key is how do you do it without rigging your current uh, revenue? And that's why they went and did this um, a little by little. But you see advertisement going on NBC about their HD, and you have to buy certain receivers to be able to watch them. But they're going in that direction because he and NBC and others, they paid a lot of money to upgrade to HD, and they want to recover this investment. Thank you. Uh, one, one, question, one quick comment. Uh, well, the market auto-regulate itself at some point. Now, why we cannot or the, these channels won't shut down, as Mohammed said, they have certain agendas. So out of the 650 channels, if you take out the political-driven agendas, they take the religious channels, the marketing channels that are being used as a vehicle to promote other stuff, your left off was like maybe hundreds, 120 at most. Uh, not talking about OSN, we're talking about the free TV stuff. So out of those 100, 120 channels, but you can really directly select who's going to survive, who's going to consolidate, and consolidation is going to happen in the next 18 months, I think, between these 100 channels. We're going to see more of that. The rest are going to be still there. They're going to still be out there. They're going to still on satellite. I don't think that they really pose any threat to the industry unless they start to uh, pirate air airing, illegally airing stuff. But besides that, I don't see them really being a big effect on the industry. And on-demand services such as yours, online on-demand services, is I can, I can tell you, I can name now like 12 uh, players that are coming into the region in the next six months to establish something similar to your platform. Because they see the, 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 uh, the power of the internet and the power of online streaming and the number of connection, number of users on the internet, and that all has, the data hasn't been shared, and, but they can see that from, again, the Arab Spring effect and how a Facebook revolution created all that trend that people are connected, people are willing to look into the internet, and even they are willing to stream and pay for content online. And even following the old model, I mean, exactly. we're, we're still the new kids on the block, and uh, when I think there was a slide that says on average, all of, on the 600 um, networks, they basically generate a million dollars of revenues a year in average. That's, we've already outperformed that on advertising only. So uh, I'm just saying that it's very interesting to look at, uh, like you said, if there are many players growing in that market, uh, it's all about flexibility. So uh, it's, it's something great that, you know, you I guys think there was at. another question in this area. Did somebody else put their hand up here? Uh, the lady was, no? Oh, uh, just there, beg your pardon, you're right. Just on the right of the aisle, you've got it. My name is Soha Zahran from Oman TV. Um, when I entered this room to, uh, to this lecture, actually, I was thinking of two things, the private sector and the government sector. Uh, the public TV, um, how we can uh, look to the future of the public TV, especially when we uh, recognize there is a lot of uh, public TV are uh, running uh, on HD. Um, this has led me to the challenge in uh, public TV. Not always the, the market of the advertising uh, is, um, uh, is available in some, you know, in some, in some countries. Uh, so here we have to pay more for the HD and the other expense. What, what do I mean? So do you think the people in Middle East are, will be um, accepting the idea of paying for, for watching TV, even the public or the government TV, to, to give them a good content and, uh, let's say, the, 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 the HD running. This is... Well, can, go, ahead, the, go ahead, uh, I think the answer is yes and no. Um, we're talking to government uh, TV channels, and they have certain channels that they say this will never go pay. So these are the government uh, voice. They are never going to go. Because uh, principally, they're satisfying their local e audience. Exactly. Yeah. However, they are also looking at 
doing other channels on pay, other content, which content that they pay premium for to bring to the Middle East, they are now considering to convert it to pay. Uh, some, um, again, government channels, they're looking at best off. You know, they, they have uh, football, they have movies, they have, and, and they, they, they think, first of all, yes, the market will eventually convert to pay one day or another. The question is when. But um, some broadcasters now, government broadcasters, start to think, I'm paying a lot of money, and I need to recover this money. And one way to recover this money is to make uh, a, a viewer-supported model, okay? Now, there are many ways you can do that. You can do a, um, a best off, or you can do even time shifting. And in other words, you can first run movie, you do it first on that channel that is uh, uh, viewer supported, and then you put it free to air after that. So there are many ways to go around this, but uh, uh, it's just we firmly believe that eventually there will be a big part including government channels that will have uh, uh, encryption in it and viewer supported model. Nick, have you got a comment? A comment? Well, I mean, I was just, given that we're here in Cannes, um, I'm just curious as to how many in the audience, how many channels there are, I mean, uh, uh, that are trying to get into the Middle East and, and what their experience is. I, I don't know whether there uh, are we can, any. We can poll this, this thinning out audience because we've gone past our, uh, our allotted time. But uh, how many of you are, are looking to get into the Middle East directly, or I? None. Okay, you're all you're all lo you're all local. Um, uh, we are out of time, but let me pose a quick question down the line. When Orbit started transmitting, gosh, you know, more than 15 years ago, with uh, an MPEG one and a half system. It, it revolutionized uh, broadcasting in the region. It opened people's eyes to the quality uh, that was possible. Same with, uh, with Nasdaq. Does it need something dramatic? Does our industry need something dramatic, like 4K, to come to the region in a couple or three years' time to kickstart um, a, a real revolution in broadcasting in the region? Mohammed? Um. <laughs> Let's deal with the HD first. <laughs> Let's get the HD good quality uh, on the satellite. And that's why in your life we said eight meg minimum because we run a study. We run a. We collected all the channels that our shareholder has more than one thousand channels, and we took the average. It was uh, ten to thirteen meg. The average in the Middle East is three meg. Yeah. So we said that we will do eight meg to to compromise, but. Um, uh, we want the people first to learn the, uh, the, that there is a good quality picture out there. Um, however, 4K is coming. This is just the, the normal evolution of the technology. Another step have. on the road. Of course. Yeah. Uh, Nick? I, I have to go with Mohammed on this. I, um, 4K is, is a great model if you happen to be a satellite operator. I'll say that much. <laughs> I, I think um, there seems to be a resounding view within the room, uh, both up here and down there, that the most important thing is to have a great, compelling show, great content, and start from there. I think for me, whether it's HD or 4K, anything that can help to improve the dynamics in the Middle East market, to learn some of the lessons that have been learned in more mature television markets, that's good, because at the moment, it's kind of a, a strange market, and there are things that could be done that would really dr dramatically improve it. As to what 4K can add to the equation, I, I tend to think that HD is just about affordable for broadcasters. So 4K capacity, you then really are talking about deep pockets, which probably means more government money to go in. So I, I tend to be of the view that, yeah, let's, let's start with let's, HD. Let's solve the HD problem first. Uh, Yusuf, you're not going to be spending any money on 4K cameras just yet. Um, well, I mean, uh, thanks to Mohammed for, for arranging this, this event, and, and I appreciate 2K and 4K, but I, I always think of the audience and, and my, fam you know, our viewers. I don't think at this stage, 
you know, it's like telling them Mars when they haven't gone to the moon yet. And, and let's just get <laughs> HD let's get in the place. Yeah. And, and like Marwan was saying, and I think we all agree, it, it's all about content. And I think we all as broadcasters have a long way to go in really serving our audience with really engaging content uh, in the Middle East. Uh, I think we have a long, long way to go. And, um, and a lot of it has to do because we, we buy series before they're shot. Um, and, and a lot of the ecosystem of production is just wrong. And once we have really dynamic, engaging shows that are hits, then broadcasters turning HD is nothing for them because then the revenues are there. Uh, Marwan, any d digression? Well, I think a couple of things. One is, uh, as Tim Craig has said today and in one of his panel, the panels, we need to stop manufacturing content for the audience and we need to start making content with the audience. That's a key thing in the Middle East, it's not happening. And that also goes back to the public TV question that the lady asked, the government TVs need to change. <laughs> they cannot keep saying, received goodbye, you know, this mustaqbal mm -hmm. all the news bulletin, what the prince who, who had seen today and who said goodbye to him. We need to move beyond that, those days are over. If they keep doing it, they're not gonna make it. Nobody wants to watch an HD news bulletin about the meeting of the ruler. That's Given we want, we want to see what's happening, but again, we need more. Government TV needs to be involved more in the people's lives and more giving them what they want to, to, to see and watch and what's happening in their country. So that's a key thing that we need to start making content with the audience. That's number one. I think the second point that should happen is going back to the drawing board and start creating a new ecosystem for the content production. We don't have a content production cycle, we only focus on 30 episodes of Ramadan. That's it. Everybody is so focused on producing 30 episodes for Ramadan and he rests 11 months of the year and not doing nothing and repeating and repeating the, the 45 or 40 series that they get produced for one month, which is, sorry to say that, a stupid way of spending your money and not making any production cycle that goes on with the production, with the scheduling uh, period, with the season from September to May, summer season, all this, we just don't have it. We just have one month, that's it. These two has, has to happen. Um, good end comments. Thank you very much, uh, Marwan, Yusuf, Nick, Mohammed. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, thanks for your ideas. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for your questions. Appreciate it.